Israel is the startup nation, with one out of every thousand people turning into an entrepreneur. And the number of new venture companies founded in a year exceeds the total number of exiting venture companies in all of the European countries combined. Technion Israel Institute of Technology, established in 1912, is a cradle of entrepreneurs. It is one of the world's top three universities in the field of electronic engineering, alongside Massachusetts Institute of Technology and California Institute of Technology in the USA, and its faculty includes three Nobel laureates. Technion is headed by Dr. Ferech Lavi, who was appointed as a president in 2009. After receiving his PhD in Physiological Psychology from the University of Florida in 1974, he returned to his home country a year later to set up a sleep research lab at Technion. Lavi has won multiple awards, including the Sleep Research Award from the University of Pisa in 2004 and the Israeli EMET Prize in Medicine in 2006. Meet Perech Lavi, who has been nurturing young and innovative minds at Technion for the past 40 years. Today we'll be meeting Professor Perez Lavi, President of Technion, Israel Institute of Technology, and a sleep disorder researcher. We'll be discussing the issues faced by universities across the world, the future of innovation and entrepreneurship, and the new role of universities in the fourth industrial revolution. Perez, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. I know you've had a very busy couple of days. You're here for the International Presidential Forum on Global Research Universities. How has that been and what's the forum about? It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I must say that uh, we met for the last two days. Yeah. Um, 35 countries, 80 universities, wow. presidents and vice presidents. And surprisingly, everybody has the same problems. <laughs> so uh, uh, we had discussions, mm -hmm. we shared ideas, and I found uh, first it was perfectly organized, beautifully organized, and I enjoyed every minute. And mm -hmm. I think I, I'm, I'm returning to Israel with some new ideas okay. and new insights. So what specific topics was talked we, about at the forum? We discussed issues related, uh, as you, in your introduction, you said, uh, what is the role of university mm -hmm. toward the second half of the 21st century? Uh, entrepreneurship, what is the social responsibility of universities? Mm -hmm. How uh, uh, the revolution, uh, the fourth revolution in industry will affect universities and how universities should accommodate okay. to the revolution. And uh, uh, it was very interesting to listen to presidents and vice presidents of other universities and to compare to what we have in Israel. Okay. Well, the interview crew went along to the International Presidential Forum on Global Research Universities, and we'll take a look at the footage right now. The 2016 International Presidential Forum on Global Research Universities was held at the Grand Hyatt Seoul in April, bringing together about 130 people from 33 countries. The key topic was social responsibilities of higher education and strategic global partnership. The attendees shared their ideas on industrial academic cooperation and sustainable global partnerships among other topics. Another good reason to move the meeting from uh, July. We have a lot about uh, universities' uh, social responsibility as an organ that is responsible to sponsor practical applied research and commercialization of research. It will be of some uh, uh, help to people who are looking at how to foster ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship. As the keynote speaker, President Lavi explained the background behind Israel's emergence as a startup nation. He stressed the importance of government supports and an institutional framework to boost innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that this is a particularly important talk, which really shows the higher education's responsibility in the 21st century for us facing our challenges of today challenge is how do we educate the future leaders 
in our higher education so that they can be effective in uh, leading the world, especially through international collaboration, uh, through deep mutual understanding and cooperation. To hear how they were able to do it is uh, very inspiring. Um, and I love the commitment to the diversity because that's really important, but I also love the commitment to making a difference to society because I think universities have to do that now. So in your keynote speech, you mentioned that the Office of the Chief Scientist of Israel's Ministry of Economy plays a very important role in innovation and entrepreneurship. Could you explain for us what it exactly is that the OCS does and what its role is? Yes. You know that uh, universities for centuries were a um, citadel of new knowledge. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to transform the knowledge into uh, um, devices, uh, uh, technologies that will be uh, useful or uh, benefit mankind, mm -hmm. there is a need for transformation. Yeah. And uh, in Israel, uh, the chief uh, scientists uh, provide us with means to take a concept that was developed in a university mm -hmm. and to try to see whether it has a practical uh, use. Okay. I'll give you an example from my own experience. I'm an amateur entrepreneur myself. Right. Uh, as a sleep researcher, my interest for many years was in the flow of blood during sleep. Okay. You know, we have different stages of sleep, so mm -hmm. blood flow in different velocities, different speed. And we found something very, very interesting that uh, uh, during certain stages of sleep, blood is uh, redirected mm -hmm. from the periphery, from the fingers, yeah. to the brain. Right. We thought that this can help us to measure certain phenomena that has clinical value. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to invest the money to test this concept, you approach the office of the chief scientist. Okay. And he gives you the available means. Mm -hmm. And then, within months, we realize that indeed it has a clinical value. Right. We develop a new device. And now it's a company, it's a public company okay. called Itamar Medical. Mm -hmm. So uh, the chief scientists play a major role in uh, testing uh, uh, ideas right. that are produced in the laboratory, whether they can be turned into devices, technologies, mm -hmm. etc. So with product. commercial value, right, precisely. Right. And this is very important mm. because mostly research is funded for basic research. Okay. There are very few means to fund this, what we call the value of death between the idea and the commercial mm. market. So it's quite a big step. It is a big from step. From the initial idea. And, and many years ago, uh, this office also started the first investment fund in new companies mm -hmm. that gave the model to others and uh, once the government had this initiative, now there are more than 80 uh, venture capital funds in Israel wow. that support uh, uh, startups and companies, etc. Mm -hmm. So the government played a major role, particularly the chief scientist, in turning Israel into what we know now as a startup nation. Okay, so just to go into a little bit more detail, I understand that the OCS runs four programs uh, for the sustainable development and growth. Yes of innovative startups. Could you explain some of them well, for us? Well, there is the Kamin. Kamin is mm -hmm. a program in which you apply. You have your idea. I have yeah. the idea about uh, blood velocity in the fingers. I submit a proposal and uh, it's competitive. Mm -hmm. There is a committee which is independent of the university and they decide whether to support us or not. Then there is uh, Magnet, Magneton and Ofar. These okay. are companies, these are uh, 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 funds that support joint projects between existing companies and university researchers. Right. Which means that I have the idea and then mm -hmm. I come to uh, Samsung yeah. and they say, oh, wow, this is a nice idea. Mm -hmm. And then the government support this matchup between okay. the researcher and the uh, uh, industrial company. Right. So these are three different companies for ideas at three different levels mm -hmm. of commercialization, mm -hmm. early, middle and late. Okay. So there are four programs that support it, and uh, I believe they are very, very important. Indeed. Um, and it seems like they do a very good job of connecting yes. the business side of things with the top brains in the country. Right. 
that can develop these innovative technologies. And all of them are competitive, which right. means uh, there is no guarantee that your, your idea will win, but mm. you have to convince right. that you have the best idea. Okay, so there's committees to vet right. all these different ideas as right. well. Okay. Um, and I also understand that the OCS runs an incubator program yes. uh, to help develop ideas that are very high risk, but are also very highly innovative yes. um, into successful startups. How does that work? Well, the incubator, at least we have one in, on the campus in the Technion, mm -hmm. is a, a physical place in which uh, we house six companies, mm -hmm. six teams that start to develop a product. We provide them with all the logistics, with uh, lawyers that will uh, register the patent, with technicians, with uh, uh, accountants, so they don't have to think about anything just to develop their product. Right. Usually they can stay in an incubator between uh, a year and a half to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of money that they pay to the incubator is very small. Once they are standing on their own feet, yeah. then they go out and found their own place. Right. In Israel now there are 24 incubators all over the country. Amazing. And uh, it's interesting that different incubators specialize in different fields. Right. So there is an incubator for medical devices, mm -hmm. like we have in the Technion. There's an incubator for uh, uh, um, a clean energy. There is an incubator for uh, uh, space-related technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it is supported by the government and the Minister of Economy and the chief scientist. Okay, and is there an incubator program on a national level as well? This is, these are all na on national level. Oh, okay. They are I simply see, uh, distributed across the country, so are not in one place. Right, right. Well, from the north to the south, and uh, uh, there is an incubator for uh, uh, products related to uh, uh, computers. Mm -hmm. The Technion specialized in an incubator for medical devices. Right. And right now we have three companies in the incubator. One has to do with stem cells, mm -hmm. and one has to do with a new device for glaucoma surgeries, right. and one has to do with medical glues, biological glues that mm. uh, uh, you use when you have uh, eruption of blood vessel, etc. And all of them started from technologies developed in the Technion, mm -hmm. and then the incubator supported them. I see, I see. And what about for students? What support systems are in place for them to implement their we, business We have ideas? many, many. Uh, we don't have a formal education in entrepreneurship. Although there is a minor, uh, engineering students can take a minor in entrepreneurship. Right. Uh, very few students take it. They okay. are too busy starting their own company. Ah, I see, I minor. see, yeah. But uh, there was uh, the opening of the BizTech. What is the BizTech? The BizTech is a national competition organized by the Technion in which teams of three to four students propose an idea we start with 250 teams, we pick the best 30. Mm -hmm. Each team of the 30 get a mentor, right. which is a Technion graduate who made it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they try to develop the idea into a business model. We pick at the end of six months of training, three of them and finance them to uh, start develop the idea into a commercial mm. project. So it's a very long-term project. Yeah, it's one year. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. The winning last year of the winning team of the BizTech was mm -hmm. invited to the White House, oh, to wow. Obama, because they develop a system that allow you to find uh, air pollution on any place on Earth. Suppose mm -hmm. tomorrow you're flying to Beijing and you'd like to know what is in Beijing yeah. or what is in Copenhagen. They develop a system that provides you with a map of air pollution throughout the world. Mm. They call it Brizometer. Okay. And uh, it, it, it was so amazing that uh, President Obama invited them to the White House. Indeed. So this is one project. But we have the same project, for instance, uh, it's called FinTech, mm -hmm. the digital aspects of the financial world. This is done with one of the largest banks. And again, it's a competition among students to suggest new technologies. Right which may be a problem for banks uh, uh, or for the bank workers, mm. but uh, this is a new. We have the same for medical students. We team them up with engineering students and again, and again ask them to think about problems that need solution. So this is one type of activities that we have. We have some courses. For instance, the most uh, famous course in the Technion is a course on innovation entrepreneurship that is given by a Nobel laureate, one mm -hmm. of our Nobel laureates, we have three of them, and he has given this course for 27 years. Right. And I'm lecturing on this course for 17 years, a mm -hmm. year after a year. I have my own 
uh, uh, part in this course. Yeah. And I try to share with them my experience in building a company mm. as a faculty member. Right. Which is not simple. Uh, it doesn't sound like it at all. So you mentioned earlier that yes. Technion students are busy setting up their own companies, yes. being entrepreneurs. Yes. And since 1995, Technion graduates have founded or led more than 2,000 companies. Yes. You mentioned some of the systems that are in place right yeah. now, but what was the driving force behind this yeah. very entrepreneurial I, I should be honest with you, I don't think it's only education. Okay. It is more than education. It has to do with national character. Okay. It has to do with the culture. It has to do with uh, uh, growing up in a country that uh, uh, challenges you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, the drive to have your own startup is something which is part of the DNA of Israelis. Okay. Uh, um, it's quite amazing to see 600 students sitting in a class and you give a talk and you see the shining eyes, mm -hmm. they swallow every word you say right. and they don't, uh, they ask a question after question. Mm. And I think it is part of the Israeli uh, uh, national characteristic, the need to achieve, to distinguish yourself, okay. to serve uh, uh, a, a higher purpose. And then when you combine it with education, and, and direction, mm. then you get this phenomena of thousands of uh, companies. Mm. It's quite amazing that uh, the, the number you mentioned, and I did a study, I, I uh, uh, ran a study to find out all these companies. Right. And I found that the number of graduates who started more than five companies mm. is amazing. I have one graduate mm. who started 29 companies. Wow. He's a graduate of uh, the Faculty of Aerospace. Uh, uh, Hopefully they're all successful though. All of them successful, wow. 29 companies. He's from aerospace and aeronautical engineering, mm -hmm. and he did it in medical devices. And uh, uh, it's, it's again, uh, he could resign and buy a house in mm -hmm. the French Riviera and enjoy yeah. his life. Indeed. A company after company because of this, uh, uh, to make a world a better place. Mm, that hunger to yes, learn yes, and make yes. things better. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, so when it comes to startups, we mentioned some of the systems that are in place in Technion, yes. um, but one of the biggest challenges is financing or right. attracting investors. Right. And I found it surprising that Technion actually has its own capital right. fund. Where yeah. do the funds come from and how is it managed? Well, uh, it's very interesting because when you start a Technion company, mm. like I had experience, I have four companies that I started, right. two of them in medical devices. Uh, you find investment and then uh, you find more investment because you start to market your product. Mm -hmm. And your part, or the technical part, uh, shrink uh, uh, more and more because of the dilution. Right. Because when you uh, get money, uh, your part in the company becomes smaller. Indeed. So Sadly. I convinced my uh, council uh, that we should use some of our money that we earn from mm -hmm. uh, uh, our commercialization in order to protect our interest in these companies. Right. So they allow me to do it. Mm. And I must say that now we have investment one fund of the Technion. And again, what I did is I appointed an external committee mm -hmm. to make sure that there is no bias and the investment is based only on an economic uh, principles. Right. And uh, this is working very nice. And uh, uh, we made, uh, I would say, investment in probably 20 companies by now, mm -hmm. uh, some of them become uh, very large companies. So we these are companies started by your students or professors? Students or professors mm -hmm. or alumni, even alumni. Right. In 2015, more than $35 million from commercialization. Wow. We have one drug on the market. Mm -hmm. It's called Azilect, uh, anti-Parkinson for the Parkinson disease, anti-Parkinson drug. There is another technique related company that became public uh, half a year ago that use specific treatment for brain cancer. Mm. Uh, it became public in New York. So I believe that uh, in the long run, a president 20 years from now yeah. will thank me for this <laughs> investment. I can totally see that happening. It sounds like there's a fantastic support system in place for these entrepreneurs. Um, and you mentioned commercialization yes. earlier, and I understand that Technion has a technology transfer yes. center, the T3, yes. yeah. that uh, supports in this aspect. Yes. What kind of help does it give? Well, T3, it's the Technion Technology Transfer right. Office. And uh, it provides you with everything you need in order to take, once you have the idea, mm. and you need to protect it by registering a patent, mm -hmm. 
uh, you have to find investors. You have to uh, uh, build a company. Yeah. You need lawyers. You need accountants. Mm. T3 provides you with everything. Mm. And uh, it is a very efficient system. Uh, uh, a unit with experts from different fields. Right. Uh, two weeks ago, we opened an accelerator on campus, which is a pre-incubator. Okay. Here, students can come, spend six months, getting small amount of money in order to take the idea not to a product level, mm. to a business plan level. Right. And uh, T3 is responsible for everything. So uh, T3 now has, just to give you an example, uh, I became a president seven years, seven years ago. Mm. We established 70 companies during these seven years. Right. Uh, uh, the total investment in these companies, outside investment, was $340 million. It's a huge amount. And this is all T3 performance. Mm -hmm. uh, they are excellent people. So it kind of allows the students or professors to concentrate on the technology and the development rather than or the peripheral things that come with running a business. You see, professors are professors, they're yeah, not business people. Indeed. Um, the deal with the professor in the Technion is that the IP, the intellectual property mm. that is produced in the laboratory belongs to the university. The university invests everything that is needed to protect the idea and to find investors. Mm -hmm. And then all the profits is split 50-50 between the professor and the university. Okay. And you mentioned the mentor system yes. earlier as well. So yes. uh, previous or Technion graduates yes. uh, voluntarily mentor yep. the current yep. students. Yes. Is there a specific system in place to facilitate that process? And what's the university's role? Well, we call it Technion for life. Okay. And uh, suppose there is a, a, a graduate who, who started a company. Uh, he came to the alumni association and mm -hmm. he asked for uh, one of the uh, uh, successful alum in his field and he accompanied him. Right. He give him advice, mm -hmm. he share his experience with him and uh, it is a very, very successful program. Mm -hmm. Finding a model for this student sometimes is the most important, uh, I would say, step in his career. Indeed. And what's the most successful case of entrepreneurship that you've come across in an Israeli <laughs> university, be well, it Technion or uh, somewhere else? You know, recently, uh, three weeks, three months, three years ago, uh, uh, one of our graduate students from computer science came to me and he said, Peretz, we just took public uh, our company in London, mm. plus 500. They have a kind of uh, platform yeah. for... And I'm going to give you now a check uh, uh, to support all the students on the president list. Mm -hmm. Because every year we give the students on the president list uh, uh, honorarium. And uh, they made it in less than a year. Right. They built a program, mm -hmm. they went public with multi-million company. Um, I think that Novocure, the company that came on NASDAQ with a new technology to treat brain cancer, is, is amazing success. Mm -hmm. This is a completely new technology and the Azilec, the anti parkinson and we have three more drugs in the pipeline right now. Okay, so it seems like all these systems that are in place are doing their job fantastically well. well. Yeah, I, I should uh, uh, be very careful. You know, okay. from startups, the success rate mm. is five to 100. You need, in order to be a successful entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you need to recognize that your chances of failing yeah. are higher than being successful. Indeed. And you, can, you must be able to sustain failure. Mm -hmm. you, you have to take risk. And uh, um, we look at failure as a necessary step to the uh, uh, future success. Mm -hmm. And if people cannot take failures, I recommend they won't go into the startup business. Yeah, it's that, not I mean, for them. that's a very refreshing way of looking at things. Now, we're here at KAIST yes. right now, the Career Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And I understand that Technion has an exchange program yes. with KAIST. Yeah. What kind of aims do you hope to achieve with that program? Well, I think that we can learn a lot from each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the uh, Korean students can uh, learn from the spirit of uh, uh, the startup nation yeah. and the enthusiasm of having your own uh, company, your own startup, we can learn from the th methodic uh, uh, way of building uh, large companies. Mm -hmm. I think Korea have made probably a miracle transformation in Indeed. the last 50 years that there is no precedent, maybe only Israel, uh, uh, no precedent in the mm -hmm. world. 
Uh, we also move from an agriculture country to a high-tech country, but mm. here uh, uh, it's, it's simply amazing. And I think that sharing the experience and sharing uh, uh, the uh, qualities that are uh, um, uh, typical of each uh, uh, country will be a win-win-win mm -hmm. uh, situation. So we are looking forward to collaborate. We signed an agreement with KAIST. Right. It was a three-party agreement, Singapore, KAIST, uh, Nanyang uh, 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 Technological University, mm -hmm. KAIST, and the Technion. And I'm sure that uh, it will be, as I said, a win-win-win situation. Okay, so is it just in the beginning stages right now? No, we, we have collaboration with KAIST before. Okay. We have uh, a faculty exchange and we have, uh, uh, but this will be a formal now with respect to students, with respect to research projects mm -hmm. that uh, will be done jointly, absolutely. Okay, so Israel has been called the startup nation uh, and state support, I believe, was very important in creating this very stable entrepreneurship yes. ecosystem. What's the current entrepreneurship model or framework, if there is one? Well, I think that once you ignite the process, mm. it, has a, it starts to have a life of its own. I don't know the exact number of startups in Israel right now, but probably it's around uh, five to 6,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, we uh, witness uh, a very strong and stable high-tech sector. Right. You know, there are about 300 research and development centers in Israel uh, of all the multinational companies, from Samsung uh, to Yahoo and Google and Apple and Microsoft and IBM and Qualcomm and Broadcom. Mm -hmm. Most of them have an R&D center 15 minutes drive from the Technion. Oh, wow. Okay. And our students spend, uh, unfortunately, some of them, more time in the R&D centers than in the classrooms. <laughs> okay. Uh, which uh, which uh, may the, be a good thing yeah. or not. Well, it's a good experience, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, uh, uh, they postpone their graduation. So uh, uh, Israel has become the research laboratory of most of the companies right. in the world. Uh, the question is, and this is the criticism of the Israeli system, how you take a, a startup and you make it into a Samsung. Mm. And this is, I think, what we lack in Israel is the knowledge, the experience to build uh, uh, very large companies. Uh, many of the companies are bought by the large ones. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Apple bought several startups in Israel, in right. Yahoo, and, and uh, Microsoft, and Facebook, etc. Uh, but we still need this link between the startup and a small size company mm -hmm. and the large ones. Okay, so what kind of measures are in place? I mean, we talked about the OCS programs earlier, but yes. I think that relates more to the beginning stages beginning of the stage, program. Yeah. What systems are in place, what support is in place by the Israeli government to support small to medium-sized companies? Well, the, not much. I think maybe this is the problem, mm. that uh, uh, the tax issue is better in other, uh, uh, you know, I heard the, uh, one of the participants here was the president of uh, the City University of Dublin, mm. the taxation in Ireland now encourage large companies to right, come, right. and I think here in, in, in Korea too, we, we have less favorable taxes for large companies. And maybe here is the key, how to build large companies. Mm -hmm. Another issue is the market is very far away. Like in, you have China around the corner, we have to go to the market, uh, uh, to the US mm -hmm. or to Europe, because around us, it's not such a friendly environment so as much, you know. No. Uh, so, for instance, when we built our company, Itamar Medical, that produced a device to measure blood flow, immediately we opened a market in the U.S. and mm -hmm. an office in the U.S. because this is where the market is. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, it, it, the structure of companies should be like a pyramid, mm -hmm. uh, a very large base of uh, startups, then uh, uh, small size companies at the top. We need more uh, uh, multinational co corporations, like mm -hmm. we have Checkpoint and, uh, and uh, Mellanox, but not enough. So here is where we have to put our effort in the years to come. Okay, and do you see that environment changing? Slowly, mm -hmm. slowly, yes. Okay, um, let's talk about the fourth industrial yes. revolution then. We're slap bang in the middle of it. We have these new technologies, well, they're not so new anymore, artificial intelligence, the internet of things. Um, and we have numerous startups popping 
up everywhere centered around these technologies. Yes. Do you see this current trend continuing? Are there any limitations? Every airport uh, tells you that uh, it is here to stay. Mm. Uh, you don't stand in line to go to take your uh, boarding card. Indeed. You put your uh, uh, credit card and the boarding card is coming out. Mm -hmm. um, this will probably go further and further. The next will be the banks right. and uh, uh, other service uh, oriented industries. And uh, I truly believe that we have to prepare ourselves for uh, uh, the era when uh, uh, human labor will not be needed in many service-oriented uh, industries. Mm -hmm. And here we have to think how to find jobs for people. Indeed. Uh, uh, and I'm not so sure that we are giving enough attention to this issue. And uh, we may find ourselves in a situation where, again, the robots or the uh, machines with artificial intelligence replacing uh, uh, manual labor mm. and people uh, will find themselves uh, uh, out of jobs. I truly believe in 10 years we probably will conduct this interview. I'll speak in Hebrew, mm -hmm. you'll hear it in Korean, right, not in right. English, and you'll talk to me in Korean mm -hmm. and I'll hear it in Hebrew. It doesn't seem Be that far off, in fact. It, it, it's not far off. Mm. And uh, this will be probably the, the ultimate revolution, mm -hmm. that people will be able to communicate in their own languages yeah. uh, with, with effortless. Mm -hmm. So it's here, it will stay, it will be in rapidly developing, and we have to give our attention to it. Again, it is less, I believe, uh, uh, appropriate or important to Kaist and the Technion. Mm. Because we are educating the leaders of this revolution. Indeed. They'll find a job, always. Mm -hmm. What we need to think is about the largest portion of population yeah. that are working in banks, in travel agencies, mm -hmm. in airports, etc. And here is a big question that maybe sociologists and uh, people who are dealing with social sciences mm -hmm. have to uh, give uh, much more attention. Indeed. I mean, it's already becoming right. a large problem. Let's talk about your background. You actually specialized yes. in sleep disorder research, and you were even the dean of medicine at Technion yes. at one point. Um, could you explain for our viewers who may not be so familiar with the discipline what exactly sleep research is? Well, for many years, uh, sleep was considered everything that happened between uh, good night and good morning, mm -hmm. which means nothing happened. <laughs> But now we know that sleep is a very complex behavior mm -hmm. and very complex physiological state. When we go to sleep, we start a journey, a nightly journey, in which we uh, uh, pass from a stage to stage, and uh, there are certain uh, uh, rooms in this apartment that we are uh, touring at the night, okay. in which we dream. Mm -hmm. uh, there are certain stages in which we sleep very deeply or very lightly. And uh, sleep has its own laws, and it has a vast importance on a waking portion of the day. Mm. The problem is we take it for granted when sleep is normal. Yeah. But once we can't sleep mm -hmm. or we sleep too much, then we cannot function during the day. And I started to do sleep research in 1968 wow. uh, as a student. And I, the first night I spent in a laboratory, and I watched somebody sleep with electrodes and we record his brain waves. Mm -hmm. And I knew the second he start, started dreaming, I knew this is what I would like to do for academic, scientific career. Oh, wow. And uh, luckily I joined this field of research at its infancy. So I made some contributions and I wrote some books and published some papers. Wow. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing journey. And you've published several papers on the field of sleep apnea. Yes, yes. Um, could you explain for us what it is, what causes it, and if there's treatment available yeah. as well? Well, sleep apnea is uh, probably the most uh, uh, prevalent uh, sleep disorder. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it, it is a, a respiratory disorder in sleep, which means that the moment you uh, fall asleep, the moment yeah. your brain activity changes from wake to sleep, the patient with sleep apnea stop breathing. He stop breathing for 10 seconds or 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it happened once in the most severe cases, yeah. once a minute. So wow. if you sleep for, let's say, six hours or seven hours, you stop breathing 300, 400 times. 
and you wake up in the morning mm. more fatigue Indeed. than you went to sleep. Yeah. Now, it is only the issue of fatigue. It is a cause of high blood pressure, mm -hmm. heart attacks, atherosclerosis, blockage of the arteries, yeah. and it is very prevalent. Uh, one in 10 men has the disease. That's a huge number. Huge number. Mm. Uh, more men than women. Okay. And uh, um, it is the, the origin, why, is unknown. Mm -hmm. We know that there is a collapse of the airway, at the level of the, what we call the oropharynx. Uh, we do not understand if this is something to do with the brain control of the circular muscles here mm -hmm. or a local defect in the muscles. The only treatment is uh, putting a mask on the nose and pushing air under pressure to keep the airway open. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, my research in the last uh, uh, years, before I became a president, um, had to do with the mechanism of uh, high blood pressure mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, mortality of cardiovascular diseases during sleep. And uh, we came to a, a very paradoxical finding which was that uh, the patients who are at the greatest risk of dying from sleep apnea are the younger patients. Oh, that's the, very interesting. The older you go, mm. the less you are affected uh, uh, with sleep apnea. At the beginning, it was uh, accepted with many, uh, uh, you know, question marks. Mm -hmm. Now there are many more studies that support our finding. And I can just tell your passion when you're talking about uh, sleep research. So how did you go from that to becoming <laughs> the president of one of Israel's top universities? Well, usually I tell this story after a couple of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some decisions in life are a matter of a split of a second decision. Indeed. I never thought to be a dean of medicine. I never thought to be a president. Mm -hmm. um, it so happened that uh, in the Technion, a dean is elected by the faculty members. It right. is not appointed. So uh, it so happened that um, somebody shouted my name mm -hmm. in one of the meetings and I said, uh, me? No way. <laughs> but then there were circumstances that uh, uh, convinced that maybe I should do it, so okay. I served as a six years. Um, I feel like you're underplaying your abilities well, and your <laughs> skills here. But. And then I, for very strange reasons, I became a vice president. Mm -hmm. And uh, after seven years, I thought I'm going back to my laboratory, but uh, uh, I was pushed to the president mm -hmm. uh, position, which I enjoy. I enjoy yeah. very much because yeah. uh, uh, to run such a university is really a privilege. Indeed. And I feel lucky. Uh, it's simply incredible uh, to do it. Yeah. And is there any advice you could give to young adults who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs? Well, I can give advice. Uh, you should follow your heart. Mm -hmm. You should be prepared okay. to fail. Don't hesitate to take a risk. And look at failures as gained experience. Use it for your next attempt. Mm -hmm. And I think that this combination of uh, following your heart, doing what your heart tells you to do, and the uh, lack of fear of failures uh, is a key mm -hmm. to uh, somebody who would like to have his own startup and to have an uh, imprint on life and the world. Okay, that's a very good advice indeed. And the last question we always ask our guests on interview is, what is their ultimate dream or goal in life? What do you say well, yours is? I'll be very uh, banal. Peace. Peace. You know, you and I living in an area that need peace. Mm. I wish to see my grandchildren yeah. uh, not uh, uh, living in a world where uh, there is so much hatred, there is so much, I would say, hostility mm. between religions, between people. And uh, I believe that you in this part of the world uh, should have the same dream. Mm -hmm. well, it seems like there are many similarities between Israel yes. and Korea. It's been fascinating to hear about your experiences and your insights into the world of business and entrepreneurship. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you it's been for having me. It's an absolute me. pleasure to have you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay thank here you. in Korea. Thank you so thank much. You.